Welcome back to Luminaries, Life Lessons from Leaders and Changemakers in the Time of COVID. I'm Anil Chima. I'm the Director of Health and Human Performance in the Stanford Flourishing Project. And this is hosted by the Stanford Flourishing Project. We have the great honor of welcoming Doug McMillan today. Ron will do a slightly more formal introduction in a moment as our luminary for this week. And as a reminder to everyone, this series is really about asking the question, how do we lead, inspire, and make change in these unprecedented times? And this is our opportunity to hear from and interact with world-class leaders who drive large-scale change and are engaging this question right now. So as part of this lecture series, we want you to encounter luminaries in the field of leadership, business, and social innovation, ranging from noted entrepreneurs and CEOs, as uh, we have today, to change agents who are committed to enhancing individual and collective flourishing. The lecture series emphasizes your opportunity to directly interact with leading luminaries, to discuss their models and practices and learn directly from them and from their experiences. So we're gonna be weekly for uh, the next uh, four weeks in addition to this. And you get to engage not only at the ideas level and theory, but also real world practices. And we want you to walk away with a sense of an enriched leadership toolkit and that you've enhanced your change making capacity and your ability to enhance collective prosperity and flourishing in this unprecedented time of challenge when these skills are needed most. So with that, we're very glad you're here. And I'll turn it over to Ron, who will get things going with Doug. Thanks. Hello, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again at the Luminaries uh, and Changemakers uh, lecture series uh, at Stanford. We have the great pleasure uh, to host uh, this morning Doug McMillan. Uh, the, the CEO and President of, uh, of Walmart uh, and the Chairman of, uh, of Business Roundtable, uh, some of the largest uh, companies in, in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, my name is Ron Goodman. I'm uh, co-lecturing the class with, uh, with Anil here uh, together. And, uh, and my background is uh, entrepreneurship as the founder of HealthUp and the, an inventor of the health operating system, Dr. AI, and also doing some investing and uh, and writing uh, books about smiling and, and other uh, other things. And and I'm I'm really excited today to to really uh, host uh, one of the uh, one of the most important luminaries uh, of our time, who's uh, managing one of the biggest companies that impacts the lives of of so many people both uh, here in the United States uh, and around the world, particularly in the times of COVID. Uh, this lecture series started as a Stanford uh, course, LEAD 111, and, and evolved into a much bigger uh, lecture series because of the time. You know, we were surprised to, to learn that we will have to broadcast, uh, you know, rather than have host uh, Doug and other luminaries in the class. And we were very fortunate to have Doug uh, agreed to come and, and travel all the way to uh, to Stanford to meet uh, all of us in person. But, you know, our world changed in such a profound way so quickly that we're feeling very natural to actually meet Doug here, right? And it became so natural for us, and it feels like you're in the same room with us together. Uh, Doug, as I said, is the, is the CEO, uh, president and CEO of, of Walmart. He, he was uh, he, he's from, uh, uh, was born in Memphis, uh, but is uh, lived in Arkansas. He actually uh, worked in the company uh, for, for his entire career. He, he started as a summer associate, uh, you know, when he was in high school at Walmart. Uh, I think it was but unload, like loading trucks uh, at, at Walmart, if, if, I, if, I, if I know well. I, I had the, the real honor to, to meet Doug at the World Economic Forum a few years ago, and we had some great chats in the, in the context of, of healthcare and, and other important things. But, you know, looking at, at his career, it would be fascinating uh, to unfold this journey to leadership and, and becoming the luminary is at a time that is so important time like COVID now, when he has such a profound impact on, on so many people's lives and how we, uh, how we evolve out of this uh, crisis even better than what we came into it. And, and that brings me back to the framework of the course, the framework of the, 
lecture series, which is of concentric circles. You know, we're talking about leadership, we're talking about change making, we're talking about making a big difference in the world, but the way the, the framework works in this course starts with the individual. So think about it as concentric circles and we'll unpack them throughout the lecture today with Doug together in his journey uh, from his very innermost circle, which is the self, right? So the person, the aspirations, the things that are inspiring, have been inspiring to him from the very beginning, what caused change within Doug from the very beginning that helped him start interacting with his immediate environment, with people around him, right? With, 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 the, with the larger, with the company and the people in his team, then with his community, which is an even wider circle, and then going all the way to making that such a profound impact on the world. And the journey in Doug's case is even more fascinating because you will hear about the journey within a company, you know, starting with a role that was, you know, very basic, like, you know, loading trucks, uh, going to really making uh, changes to particular units and even going international. At one point, Doug went to a very important role working internationally to really managing, you know, all of Walmart and now Business Roundtable as well, leading Business Roundtable as well, which is multiple other companies to really make a huge impact in the world. And Doug, we're, we're honored to have you. We're, it's a pleasure. We want to get to know Doug McMillan, the person, and then hear from you inspiring words about, you know, how do we make this world a better place, uh, you know, with some of the things that you learned together. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's start with, with, with you and let's start with Doug McMillan, you know, the high school boy that uh, decided to take a job, a uh, summer job at Walmart, you know, lo loading trucks. And, and what, what inspired you? What, 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 what are the thoughts about young Doug McMillan back then about the world, about what you want to be, what you want to accomplish and why? We want to understand why. Yeah, sure. Um... To the extent that I can describe it, Ron, I'll do my best. What, what happened in the beginning is that my dad was a dentist and he moved us across the state of Arkansas, uh, five hour, six hour drive away from where I grew up and um, opened a dental practice in this little town called Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, he thought it was a good place to grow a practice and there happened to be this guy named Sam Walton that was building a retail business back then in the mid 80s called Walmart. And the second thing he said to me when we got here was, um, you know, you need to get a job. You're going to need some money for college. And uh, this was a small town and there were not very many opportunities. I think McDonald's was paying three thirty five dollars an hour and the Walmart warehouse was paying six fifty dollars an hour. Oh, nice. <laughs> so being, being good with math, I applied for a job to work at the Walmart distribution center and um, worked during the summers while I was in high school and then in college part of the time as well and just saw the Sam Walton story, got to watch him from a distance and see what he and the other Walmart leaders were doing. And I had these moments in the hot summer heat of a Walmart trailer, you know, north of 100 degrees, people are working hard unloading freight and, and filling orders for stores. And everyone was just so excited. Um, they were happy with the company. They believed in the values of the company. The culture was very clear to me, even in that moment. And so, you know, that really had an impression on me. And I, I went to school, got an accounting degree, and then decided to pursue an MBA, not knowing exactly what my career choices were going to be, or I was thinking about maybe investment banking or moving to New York, those kinds of ideas before graduate school. And then I met a girl that was a school teacher in Bentonville that wanted to live here. And if you're going to live in Bentonville, Walmart is the place to be. So I matched up that cultural experience and the enthusiasm and the, the things I saw in Sam and the business and um, wanting to marry Shelly. And so I applied for a job in our merchant training program and got selected to become a buyer, worked in a store for a while. And through that whole experience, um, just fell in love with the company and the challenges of the company and um, while I've been here for almost 30 years now, I've had more than 12 different jobs. I've never been bored. The challenges are immense. And it's just been a tremendous blessing and a thrill. Excellent. Excellent. And, and we, 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 we dig deeper into your core motivation, right? Like again, you know, starting at the very beginning, and these things evolve over time. So thinking about the, the concentric circles. 
right? Yeah. The core, core motivation that, that, that drove some of the early changes in you and keep driving you throughout the, the journey. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, your motivation. What drives you and why? Well, um, there's more than one answer to that. I'm sure that's true for everybody that's participating today. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe in the values espoused in the Bible and I believe in hard work and I, I like learning new things. Um, and I really value servant leadership. And what I saw in Sam and in the company was a really strong set of values. We espouse them as four that I align to personally. And so, you know, I want to do a really good job and I don't want to let anybody down. And I have a really strong competitive spirit. Like I hate losing. Um, it's been that way since, you know, I was born. Um, I've competed in sports and in other things and I am motivated by, by trying to avoid losing. Winning doesn't seem to last very long and it's a bit fleeting, um, but the pain of losing is something that I just can't stand. So, you know, I get up in the morning and I want to do what's necessary to avoid that. <laughs> and in this situation, being part of Walmart for so long, I've seen us go through these phases from our initial business model and our general merchandise stores to adding food and now becoming a digital company and building an e-commerce business. And along the way, we've had great competitors and they motivate me. And sure, we want to serve a customer. We have a purpose that, that is related to those families and the individuals that we're here to serve. But in our peripheral vision, we see competition and um, want to run faster and be better. And, and I love that. You give me a team and a scoreboard and I'm, I'm good to go. That's awesome. I, 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 read, I read that you were, you, you two played basketball competitively in high school, which I did too. And I think that, you know, I see, I hear a lot of the, uh, the, the rhetoric of, of, uh, of this coming back. So share, you know, beyond basketball, uh, you know, uh, share with us a few real experiences that happened throughout the, throughout your career and how they exemplify, right? The, 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 the values or the, the evolution of how you think about, you know, leadership, how you think about, you know, change making? Yeah, um, one of the big moments in the company's history and in my life was in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina happened mm. and the impact on New Orleans. And we were um, seeing what was happening on television and experiencing it firsthand with our stores and clubs in New Orleans. And um, I was responsible for Sam's Club at the time, our membership warehouse club business. And as everyone that was around then, I'm sure there are some people that are quite young participating today that may not remember what that felt like, but um, FEMA was not performing. The government was not stepping up. And, and that Labor Day weekend, you could see people suffering and some dying. And our CEO at the time was Lee Scott, and we were on a conference call talking about our reaction um, and doing the typical things that Walmart does to provide truckloads of water and some charitable giving and things like that. But uh, there was this one moment on that call on that weekend when Lee asked us all to um, recognize that what was happening was unacceptable and that something had to be done. And he challenged all of us to do everything we could possibly do to help in that moment, basically unleashed us from any income statement responsibility or any other pressures and said, send people, send money, send merchandise, make it happen. And all of a sudden these Walmart trucks are rolling into New Orleans and there's this one iconic image of, of a law enforcement official stopping a line of traffic going into New Orleans and it's almost nothing but Walmart trailers for as far as you can see going to the rescue of New Orleans. And um, finally we're on the ground there. We've got people helping land emergency helicopters on parking lots. We're doing um, resuscitation in the lobbies of Walmart to help save lives. Everything's flowing, and the country saw Walmart play a role. And we had been criticized for a number of things, um, impact on mom and pops, employment practices, and the decade leading up to that, largely driven to our expansion in grocery. But during that moment, everybody said, you know what, Walmart must be a good company, and those must be good people. And if you were on the inside, we were like, yeah, we are. We're actually really well-intentioned and we're really capable and we want to help. And so Lee then, after that moment, kind of turned all the rest of us and said, 
what would it take for us to become that company every day? And it led a, mind sh a mindset shift that was primarily focused on customers and our own associates to a multi-stakeholder view, which is interesting when you fast forward to 2019 when the Business Roundtable published a new statement on corporate purpose that's a multi-stakeholder view, stakeholder capitalism if you want to call it that, compared to a narrow view of just shareholders or just customers we want to have communities in the globe and, and sustainability and everything, you know, within our, our responsibility to, co to create a system, basically, business for good, mm -hmm. that when you make an adjustment for customers, you find a way for that to be beneficial to associates. And as you sell merchandise, you help move things forward from an environmental sustainability and a social sustainability point of view. So that moment in 2005 really was a mindset shift for the company. And it was a really a, an important moment for me. One of the many experiences I've had here that's caused me to want to stay here. You know, there were times when I could have gone to do something else. Um, but I just felt like this particular platform, if you can call it that, is incredibly capable of doing good. You can do, you can do good as a startup. You can do good working in government, the public sector. But for me, this this opportunity to be part of a large public company that has the right values and culture is, has been the place for me. Excellent. And, and, and you're talking, you're talking about change, right? And I, I want to show, I want to share a screen for a second with, with everybody. Uh, if you can see uh, that, I, I hope you can see the, the screen that I share. I, I visited uh, uh, your, your headquarters uh, last year uh, and you call it uh, home office, I think. Uh, and, uh, right. When I entered the lobby, you know, the, the one thing that struck me was, you know, this this uh, this picture. This is the wall in, in the, at the at the lobby of uh, you know home office, and it's Sam Walton uh, in the back there. And a quote from Sam Walton that said, "To succeed in this world, you have to change all the time, right?" And that came from Sam Walton. It felt, you know, coming from Silicon Valley, it felt to me like a a, a, a Sam that you, you see on a, on the wall of a startup, right? And and uh, and this is this was this was really interesting. So you know, to, to my next question, you know, Walmart's changed a lot since Sam Walton founded the company uh, nearly 60 years ago. Uh, what's your vision of possibility for for the future, given you know the, some of the things that you that you described? Yeah, maybe the way to start this conversation is to point out what doesn't change here, and I. You know, I think that's important. In a world where almost everything needs to change, we've tried to lead our, our people by saying there are a couple things we want you to recognize that we don't want to change. One is our purpose. It's to save people money and live better. And that came from Sam. And he articulated it in a beautiful moment as he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from um, George H.W. Bush years ago. And it, if you haven't seen it on YouTube, it's, for us, it's, it's moving. That's not something we want to change. We also have four core values, respect for the individual, striving for excellence, serving the customer, acting with integrity. Those values are timeless and we don't want to change those. Our culture, our behaviors should align to those four values and culture shifts, ways of doing things shift, behaviors can be modified and dialed up or suppressed. We're constantly working on that set of behaviors, but those values are timeless. Okay, so those things we really don't want to change. Now, everything else, wide open for change. If, if the customer does not want stores, we won't have stores. What, whatever we need to change to serve them, fulfill that purpose, operate with those values, we're gonna go do. So if you were standing in a room with a lot of Walmart associates and, and I were to say, other than our purpose and values, the one thing that's constant at Walmart is, the crowd would respond back, change. So in a world that has become digital and is transforming in so many ways, we've got this, this underlying DNA that enables us to keep changing the place. Even though our founder passed away in 1992, we can still act like entrepreneurs and be entrepreneurs with that kind of platform for operation. And the law of diminishing returns is a real thing. Like if you don't change things, you decline. And so we have to change all the time. I was in a store yesterday and I was walking with the store manager, Justin. And Justin, in the first 15 minutes of our visit, was explaining to me, we've changed our produce layout, our fruit and veg presentation. We've changed um, our online grocery capability and, 
and we've got express um, uh, fast delivery, two hour delivery launching here next week. My building's under a remodel and I've got a new healthcare clinic being constructed that'll be done on May 27th. And we put you know, all of the COVID-19 practices in place and hear all the things that have changed relative to that. And he was just telling me about change. He just got a new um, computer vision device that's helping look at the in-stock and the pet category. He just got a new robot that's roaming the aisles that is looking at in-stock that we hope to maybe put a UV light on to help, you know, sanitize and all this stuff's going on. That's like in the first 15 minutes of the conversation. That's one store manager out of 11,000 plus. This place can change. We can build an e-commerce business. We can become digital. We can run our stores differently. And if we make the right choices and we can execute them, we can be here for the next generation of retail, which is not an easy feat. And history would tell you um, that it's not. If you go back and look at all the greats, Mercantile and Sears and J.C. Penney, and we're trying to avoid being that next story about the retailer that grew and died because it didn't change by changing pretty aggressively. And this crisis has sped all that up. You know, as we were talking about before we began this session today, the world is on fast forward right now, and that's happening here too. Yes, absolutely. And, and how much of it like, is, is, is something that you're doing? I know that when you just joined Walmart at the, at the very beginning, uh, about six years ago or something like that, uh, you know, the, well, the first thing that you did is, 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 is some, some serious changes. You know, you changed the minimum wage of, of, of employees and increased that. You made a very strong com commitment to e-commerce, which is, you know, it's a big shift for, for, for the company. And, you know, tell me a bit about the, the, uh, the, the role of the leader in, in you know, it, as you are as a leader and a change maker, but how does it trickle down to other leaders in the organization? How do you inspire change throughout the organization uh, yourself? Yeah, well, the hard part about that is you have to actually change yourself. It's a lot easier to talk about change than it is to actually change. Sure. <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, like all of you, I'm sure can struggle with that at times. But I, I think what I've learned is that here anyway, it's one thing to talk about the significance of change, but if, if you don't pair that with real learning and development on your own, sure. it falls short. And so I think one of my primary jobs is to be learning all the time and to be demonstrating that learning by behaving differently, um, shaking things up in different ways and introducing new talent into the company and telling stories. Um, humans like stories. I'm sure you have the same experience. I can be somewhere and have, you know, what I think is a really important set of things to say for five minutes and then tell one story in 30 seconds and all they remember is the story. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we've done is we'll have a concept or a way that we want to change the company and then we'll bring a story along behind that. And sometimes a, a guest speaker or an associate hero to say, okay, here's the principle we're trying to change. Here's the story that goes with it. And here's the person that exemplifies that. And that has helped people with retention. So I'll do things like I've got this officer meeting um, once a month that um, uh, we, we cover business and help our leadership group understand what's happening across the 27 countries where we operate and what results look like, what our, what our focus is, Dorsey inclusion, sustainability, some sort of agenda like that. But I save the last 30, 45 minutes and I'll bring in a guest and ask them questions. And one of the great things about being in my job is that if you call somebody up, they usually take the call and they'll frequently come if you ask them to come visit. So we've had all kinds of people, um, Ken Chenault and Mark Benioff and Satya Nadella, um, Sundar Pachai's been here and, and uh, Jenny Rometty and lots of leaders um, that I get to bring up in front of everybody and interview like this conversation and say, tell me, tell me about you. Tell me about the leadership role you've been playing. And I specifically want to dive in on product management and design thinking. Satya, would you please tell, talk to us about that? Or Sundar, let, we hear about AI all the time. Um, what's it really? What is it? And how should we be thinking about it? And when, when our large officer leadership group, hundreds of people hear these stories about how all these companies are changing, they can find a lot of common thread between the work they're doing and what we're trying to do. Sure. And they realize, oh, the whole world is changing and every business is changing and we must change 
So tell me more about design thinking. Tell me more about what digital transformation looks like. What is an agile work team? How does that apply to our business? How do you really pick up speed? Oh, we can be more productive. And again, during this crisis, I saw people, we, we were getting faster as a company, but as with many, I suppose, the level of speed just clicked up. The things we used to take a week to decide, we were deciding in a minute. And all of us, including me, are just being more decisive. Like we know we have to solve that problem and we got 48 hours to solve it. How are we going to do it? And all kinds of little things, like right now we're working on what um, testing looks like, uh, diagnostic testing and hopefully eventually antibody testing for our associates. Well, how do you solve that problem and who do we need to contact to solve that problem with us from outside the company and how fast can you do it? When we started doing things like putting up plexiglass at the pharmacies and at the checkouts to protect people, um, we put plexiglass up at all of these cashier stands and all of these pharmacies and our Walmarts and Sam's Clubs thousands of locations, more than 6,000, in less than two weeks with local suppliers in every town. If you'd have told me we could do stuff like that and I could keep going and give you a lot of examples, we wouldn't have believed that. But a crisis is a great motivator. So now, as a leader, I get to look back and, and say to our folks, hey, you've already shown me you can move really fast and you can be decisive. <laughs> So now what about this? How do we get this done in a week? How do we get this done in a day? And we are having to manage fatigue. I'm sure a lot of you are just like we are, you are tired of being in this situation and um, we are too. So I've got to figure out how we manage that um, at store level and with leadership, but boy, they sure have responded well so far. I'm really proud of them. That, that, that's remarkable. And, and thank you for everybody for participating. I see a very robust participation with, uh, with questions and comments. We're going to get to uh, uh, the stage where we, we're going to open uh, it for you guys to, uh, to ask uh, that question. So keep, keep asking these questions. Uh, and uh, uh, Neil and our moderator, Steve, will, will help uh, put together some uh, questions for, for that going uh, forward. And, and that, uh, you know, in the context of, of learning, it seems to me that there's very fast learning. The, the learning is really ingrained in how you think about things and how the organization works. Uh, and, and, you know, you're talking about changes, you know, disruption, talking about the change, you know, we're going through like a big, big disruption that uh, changed our life very quickly from the time that we, you know, we, I approached you to, to join us in this course and, and doing this thing in unbelievable short amount of time, look how much change in everybody's lives. And in these unprecedented uh, times of COVID, uh, you know, I'm very curious about some of the learnings that you that you shared with us, you know, throughout the first few concentric circles that we talked about and, and applying them to a time of an abrupt change. So, yes, you, everything is accelerating right now for, for the bad, but also for the good. Like you said, sometimes a good crisis is, is a catalyzer for, for also good things. And I'd like to, to hear from you how some of these learnings that you had throughout the years were applied now in this particular situation and what we can share with us as this thing is unfolding about you know how you are continuing to learn and to to get out of this situation maybe even better than than we were when we came into it yeah um i can't keep track of the timeline exactly but as this started to happen we saw it happening in china we operate stores in wuhan and and we're experiencing this in january and thinking about what we were going to do and what our plans would be in other countries. And the reaction that we led in China did inform how we reacted here. And, and what we realized some period of time into it, maybe it was a couple of weeks or something like that, is that there were guiding principles that we could use as something to hold on to. So in a chaotic environment where there's wind and rain and noise and, and you're trying to decipher a way forward, um, just as with our purpose and values, five crisis principles emerged. And the first one is to support our associates. They're on the front line, they're putting themselves at risk. We must do everything we can possibly do to protect them and support them. And we can talk more about what's underneath that, but it's, it's financial, um, it's, it's obviously health and physical health. It's also emotional health and well-being. All three things have to be supported the second one was serving customers. I mean, we literally had to keep the food supply chain moving to avoid, avoid more chaos and panic. And we, 
we all saw that in the early stages. So, you know, being in stock on things people need to survive and, and eat is obviously a priority. So supporting serving customers was the second one. The third one we realized early on is that we had cash flow and we were open. So we were in a position to help others, not just receive benefit as some other people needed help, the airline industry or the hospitality industry, we were, we had cash flow. So we started thinking about what can we do to help other people through this crisis in a way that in the end, not only does good work for the company, but does good work for society. And so forgiving lease payments and hiring people for a temporary period of time that are furloughed from Marriott or wherever, helping others was a, was a focus. Um, then the fourth one's just managing the business through the crisis. Don't let the inventory get out of line. Make sure you have cash flow. Play defense so that you don't wake up and find out you've hurt the company in some way. And then the fifth one, which we didn't get too much in the early weeks, was how do you move forward on the strategy? And it, it just so happened that because of the way people were living during this crisis, a lot of the things that we had put in place, the e-commerce business and the online grocery pickup and delivery business from stores were what people wanted. So those things exploded and took off. So I think the, the bottom line to your question is you have to have some sort of principles or pillars. Otherwise, you're just you're reacting all the time, but we've been able to be consistent with those five things through this whole thing globally. And it's helped us make decisions in Mexico, helped us make decisions about what's most important. Um, just in the last couple of hours, we, we announced another special, uh, special cash bonus for our associates, um, which is, you know, financially challenging because the second quarter is going to be tougher than the first quarter, but it's the right thing to do. And our first priority is to support our people and they deserve it and they need it. So let's go do that again. All those decisions get informed by that underlying set of principles. Yep. So that kind of goes back to Katrina. If you maybe two quick stories, I'll try to be brief, but um, when Katrina happened and that Lee Scott conversation I was referring to occurred, he said, don't worry about what it costs. We'll figure it out later. And if we miss the quarter because of helping Katrina, we'll take the heat. So when this happened, we had the same mentality. Um, don't worry about the short-term financials. Go do what's right and, and it'll work out. And that influenced the decisions that we made early on in, in this crisis. And then we got this phone call from the White House and a request came in to do drive-through testing stations. Yep. And later on a request to help with surgical gowns and coveralls and there have been other requests. And when you get that call, you know, we kind of, a small group of us look at each other and say, well, remember Katrina, you know, we can help go do it, go try to figure it out. We don't know how to do it. We don't even know how to bill. We're not we're actually just donating the labor and we're donating the PPE we bought and we'll figure it out later. It'll probably be a good idea. So just, just go help. Those lessons from the past um, definitely showed up during this crisis. Yeah, and that's very important. I mean, like this is, uh, you know, we, we're in the, in the context of uh, the medical school at Stanford and we're talking, about, I mean, COVID itself is, a, is an issue that uh, is, is about health and, and well-being. Uh, and it highlighted a lot of, you know, the, the weaknesses and a lot of the, the vulnerabilities, right, of, of, the, of the existing system in, in health uh, and well-being. And, and just like you mentioned as a retail, jumping in to, to create these testing stations that, you know, we're, we're seeing in, in the news everywhere building clinics that I know that uh, it's, a, it's a new initiative that, uh, that you guys have been rolling out and you talked about that in, in, in your description of, of your manager, that it's one of the things that he, that he highlighted when he talked about uh, innovation. Uh, talk with us a little bit about the, the, the next steps of that, right? So coming out of this with all the learnings that we have, uh, with, that, with a serious focus that, that uh, you and Walmart have on these things in the context of healthcare, in the context of technology, talk with us about the future of that a little bit, you know, and what, what does it bring with it to become better going forward? Yeah. Well, when you think about our purpose and what Sam said, let's help, help people save money and live a better life. That and live a better life includes things that we can, we can do to cause people to have a better life and health and wellness are at the top of that list. And there's this great video of Sam when he was battling cancer the second time, he eventually passed away as a result of cancer, where he, he, he shares his frustration with the healthcare system. And he's talking to the Walmart leadership group. And he says, I expect you to fix it. Like I want healthcare fixed. <laughs> and that would have been in like 92, 91. So we're a little late. 
Um, but, you know, healthcare as a percentage of GDP is going up and, and people are not happy with their healthcare experience, generally speaking. And so there's, there's a need for change here. And we think our purpose and our values and the other assets we have, including being the largest grocer in the country, give us an opportunity to help people. So if you can put together the data related to what you eat and give people alternatives that help them consume in a healthier way, and you can give them access to affordable, high quality preventive care. This isn't an urgent clinic effort. This is a preventative effort. And you can give them some support related to how much they're moving. I think the long-term plan, which hopefully happens sooner rather than later, includes that dimension as well. So there's a digital component as well as a personal component. There's a, you know, our bodies are our bodies and they, they are not digitized. And so while a lot of this can be done through telehealth and we've seen the explosion of telehealth and digital and, and are thinking about a number of the digital aspects of our healthcare initiative, we think these big boxes and big parking lots close to people combined with the food opportunity, give us some unique things to work with to create a holistic whole health offer for our customers that's affordable. So we started opening preventative care clinics Last year, we opened our first two in Georgia. We've got a third one coming um, here in Arkansas, the one I was mentioning earlier um, in June. And we're learning how to um, make a business model work. Um, you know, my dad was a dentist. I understand the cost of a dental chair. Uh, there, are, there are equipment needs and depreciation things to work out and staffing issues. But so far that we have a medical doctor present, we have a, a wide range of services from hearing and, and optical, you know, we, we take blood, we do x-rays, we'll fill a tooth. It's a pretty holistic preventative care offer. Um, that feels to us like something we can figure out. And, um, you know, we are piece by piece. It's just a bunch of little problems to solve that add up into a bigger problem getting solved. So we're very excited about it. We're, we're committed to figuring it out. We know it's complex. We're sure that it will be challenging but we'll just stay with it and we'll keep iterating and the fourth one will be better than the third one and the digital aspects will happen and mobility and other aspects um, will occur and hopefully end with us making a big difference for people in this country, but also having a, another important pillar of Walmart's business. Excellent. That, that, that's inspiring. And, and, and I want to go back with this, you know, with the learning that we have, you know, from, from your entire career and trajectory within Walmart, in this crisis, we talked about Katrina, uh, lots of lessons and, and lots of a very rich conversation, lots of questions and answers that we'll get to immediately after that. Uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about advice, right? So you're talking, there's a bunch of leaders in, in the audience right now uh, in multiple levels, right? And, and they're looking uh, up to you for, for some good learnings and advice uh, of what they can do you know, to lead, and particularly in, in a very quickly and rapidly changing world. Right, so yeah. we talked about it just before the the, uh, the lecture started. You know, we're going into a new normal. You know, and it, it's going to take some time. Right, so you know, tell us a little bit about how you think about this and what they can do. Right, to really uh, you know drive change and drive change at scale. And let's open the aperture wider. As as I said, you you were running things globally. Uh, uh, Walmart is, uh, you know, it's an American company, but it, it, it has a very large global footprint as well. So let's, let's open the concentric circle to the world as well. So what kind of advice we can get from you? Mm. Well, I think your concentric circle image is the right one to start with. You have to start by taking care of yourself and understand yourself, be self-aware, make sure that your life is what you want it to be in balance, because if it's not, everything else doesn't really work very well. So you know, whether it's your spiritual health or your physical health, um, getting exercise, being around the people that you love, your family, your friends, that's got to be addressed. Um, and somewhat deliberately because you can get off track being consumed with your startup or your business. And, and so you have to be, again, self-aware as it relates to that. Then as you move out in those rings, you know, you eventually get to this, this business or purpose ring and your values need to be aligned with whatever you're building or you've joined and the people around you um, have to be the kind of people that you want to work with. And that's, that's something that, you know, I didn't in the beginning completely understand. We, we have so many people, Walmart's got 2.2 million people. We've got all kinds of people. And so 
for a while I was thinking, well, you just end up with all these different kinds of people and you figure out how to do extraordinary things with ordinary people. And while to a large extent, that's still how I, how I feel, I've also developed a great appreciation for what extraordinary talent looks like. And the leaders that we have around it, me and us are extraordinary people um, as individuals and they happen to be really good at what they do. And having a really high bar for your talent and who works around you is so important. And when, when you know in your gut that someone's not in the right job or shouldn't be part of the team at that moment, you just have to do something about it. And that was one of the more difficult things that I had to learn as a leader is how to have conversations with people that needed to move on and do something else for the company's good or for their own good or both. So I think that talent bar has got to be high. And then when I think about that around the world, we're, we're operating in 27 different countries with stores and um, e-commerce businesses, and we source from all over the world. So we're kind of almost everywhere where there's commerce happening. You cannot grow a business like that without extraordinary people. When COVID-19 happened in China, our leader, Yuan Warren Tan, knew what to do, had the right values, was a servant leader and engaged. And when we were sleeping over here, he was making it happen in China. And there was no way anybody from here could do that. So you just have to ex extend that. And then what happens over time is you learn as an organization how to spread what's common and create some form of leverage of IP or other assets and when to leave people alone so that they can act and move quickly. And so it's a, uh, in our case, uh, there's a lot of independent decision making on the ground in these countries, but with a common purpose, a common set of values, some things that we share, and beyond that, they're running, you know, independent businesses. And so I, I don't run Walmart. Um, I help lead Walmart. You, you can lead it. Sometimes I imagine a rope, like you cannot lay a rope on the table in front of me and push it, but you can pull it. You can get in front be a student, learn, set a good example, and try to lead, and others will follow. But if I tried to run this thing or push it, I would completely fail quickly in a very public way, <laughs> <laughs> which would be painful. Hopefully, that's not the case. Not hopefully, obviously, it's not the case. So, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you for that. That's, that's, uh, that's important, inspiring, and, and, and helpful. And I want to I uh, turn it to Anil. I know that we have lots and lots and lots of questions but, that people want to ask you. So, uh, Anil, why don't you take it from here with the, with the, with the students and the audience? Great. Thank you, Doug uh, and Ron. Um, we want to make this piece interactive. We've got a bunch of uh, questions, uh, more than we have time for. So we'll do a bit of a rapid fire in the last 15 minutes. Uh, but, Doug, please take the amount of time you feel necessary to address these questions and to the, the wonderful community there who are giving the questions. I'm going to synthesize some and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so we'll start with a question uh, from Esther Dyson. Uh, and I think this is a great question for leaders right now, right? Which is, does the coronavirus situation cause you to think more short term or long term? And how do these two interact for you right now? Mm. How do you balance that uh, tactical and strategic? It's a really good question, Esther. When I mentioned those five principles earlier, the fifth one was move your strategy forward. What's happened is in the early stages, we weren't getting to that as much. There was a certain amount of our strategy that the customers were pulling forward, but we were really dealing in the next 24 hours in the next few days. As time has gone on, I think we've got a bit of a better balance of getting out ahead of this thing more than we were in that, that crucial um, real crisis moment. But I, that's part of what's going on in my inner voice, that, that specific question is I'm, I'm asking myself, what am I missing? And am I still too short-term sh short -term oriented? And do I need to get farther out? And even the business roundtable, as I interact with other CEOs, I think they're experiencing the same. We're all trying to figure out what exposure notification looks like and how we're going to do it for our businesses and how reopening works and what we're going to do about testing. Those are all things that we're facing right now and will for the next few weeks and months. They're not two years out. So I, I think we're still in more of a short-term mindset than we were before in, in those respects. 
So I think uh, connecting to what you just said, you referenced, of course, the business roundtable a, a few times here. And, and so here's a question from uh, someone in the community. Uh, specifically, what's the role of the business roundtable and its member companies uh, in responding to this? And I might, I might add, you'd reference different sectors, right? We have the sector of government, we have the sector of uh, a variety of sectors inter interacting and business roundtable represents a, a, a cross section of sectors within business and business, business writ large. What's its role in responding to um, crises like this? And how are you seeing some of the most uh, innovative responses within uh, the members of the roundtable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those that might not know, the business roundtable is comprised of about 200 of the largest companies that are based here in the U.S. And it's a unique opportunity and one that I enjoy to sometimes put my Walmart hat to the side and think about what's best for the country. And so on a daily basis, the BRT is trying to influence policy to create a stronger country. That's the, that's the goal. And there are lots of different pieces of work underneath that related to workforce or privacy, things like that. During the crisis, those things are continuing to some degree, but we're really more focused on the short term and trying to help advise government leadership, both at the federal level and the state level, on what good policy looks like. And in the beginning, it was all about the health crisis, continues to be, but increasingly over the last few weeks, we've been more involved in um, helping give good advice on how to open up. So there are a number of retailers involved and we help provide information about what PPE is needed and what social distancing looks like within a store or a restaurant. There are other industries that are contributing to thoughts on manufacturing, for example. And we've been creating material and providing it to the White House, to members of Congress, and to governors to say, if it were us, here's how we'd do it. Mm -hmm. You write the rules, we don't, but here's the very best advice we can give you. And so what I've seen is a group of business leaders, the CEOs and teams that work with them that over the last few months have worked together in a really faster, more efficient way with their personal agendas, almost for the completely set to the side. I mean, some of them are really worried about their business surviving. So you can see that personal agendas show up sometimes, but yeah. generally people have done a good job of setting that to the side, to the side and trying to do what's best for the entire country. And, um, it's been imp impressive to watch. I'm on multiple Zooms a week where we're trying to give good advice. That's really what it boils down to. So to pivot from that a bit to the question of, of culture, you alluded to the unique culture that's been built in, in Walmart that you've inherited and that you've also helped participate in shaping. And many of the folks in the community here are, are involved in a, a variety of types of organization where creating a sense of culture is key to the type of change making that they are doing. So uh, there's a question here from Jacob. Walmart's culture is clearly key. How do you maintain a strong and consistent culture? And are there actions you take which you think are unique to Walmart in, in um, creating that culture? Yeah. Um, first thing I'd say is I think it matters whether it's a small, young startup or a big business. I think this is really important. And you have to be clear on what your values are, what your purpose is, and what you want your cultural behaviors to be. And then most importantly, the leaders have to act that way. Like you have to live it. It's got to be authentic and what you do habitually, not something that's forced. Because if it's not you, it won't last. And it can't just be the person that's in the, the lead job. It's got to be a broad group of leaders that are behaving that way. So, you know, we can't have leaders that are um, not aligned to our values or they do damage. And we have to remove them from the company. And, and we do that from time to time for that reason. It's just, there's just not a fit there. So the first issue is you have to behave this way. And then the second thing is, you have to reward what you want to see repeated. And you can do that in a number of different ways. Um, storytelling, financial rewards. I think, I think that is just so important. And what we do here, which is probably not unique, but it works here, is, is what I mentioned earlier. And that is to find an example of the behavior that you want to see. Take that person or that team and lift them up and shine a spotlight on them and say, look at what this person or team did 
and here's what the result was, and the underpinning value of that was X, and this behavior is what we want to see, please help me recognize these people. And you just do that over and over again, and it ends up forming a mosaic, and people can, they can see it, and it's substantive, and they see it in their store manager, or they see it in, in another leader. So that cultural shaping is done through um, acting and then storytelling. So that, that connects perfectly to the next question from Brian, um, which you had mentioned earlier, one of the essential pieces is to attract the right talent, right? And, and again, in all of these types of organizations that people are participating in, leading and shaping, getting the right talent is so foundational. And so this question is around, what's Walmart's philosophy for of organizational footprint? as it relates to constructing teams and attracting talent. And um, he also asks, is, is Bentonville headquarters an asset or impediment to attracting talent? And I might say more generally, like you, what role does geography and footprint have in, in, in talent and how might um, the virtualization of teams and so on, uh, you've alluded to, right? Having a global team and global mm -hmm. team leads in different time zones. Uh, and how you attract the right talent for different regions across the world uh, that mm -hmm. that still fit into a cohesive culture. Um, you know, can you discuss a little bit about that question of attracting talent in a very, very diverse and distributed um, footprint? Sure. I think it's important to remember that out of our 2.2 million associates, probably 2.3 million today, um, almost all of them are in stores, uh, Sam's clubs or distribution centers. So you've got a two to 300 person team that's running a $100 million business in a Walmart store. And the way that their teams work together is the most important driver of the company. But that obviously is influenced in a big, big way by what happens with leadership. As we started growing outside the United States in 1991, we started having, having offices and decentralized decision making in places like Mexico City. And, and now we're in Shenzhen and we're in New Delhi and Bangalore and we're we're operating in offices all around the world. And in the United States, we have several thousand people that work in the Bay Area, and we've got a team of a, more than a thousand that work in the New York area and other offices around the country, a tech office in Dallas. We have too many offices, I think, generally speaking, and this virus has revealed that we don't need them all, that a, that a lot of people can work from home. Engineers thrive in that environment. We've seen our tech productivity go up in this environment that we're in right now. And so in the last few weeks, we've been stepping back to look at, at where all these facilities are and thinking about the construction of a new home office that we started um, a couple of years ago here in Northwest Arkansas. There's a, a beautiful um, campus starting to, to be constructed that we are going to proceed with. We may tweak some things as that new home office is created um, it's got bike trails and it's, it's going to be really cool, but there may be some things we need to do spacing wise to help, but I don't want to overreact to the virus. We are going to have a vaccine at some point, And by the time I get that office built, we'll have a vaccine, but we won't all be in Arkansas. It's, it's generally a strength, but we can't let that be such an impediment that we don't get the best people. So we'll continue to have work from home, probably in a bigger way. We'll have offices in California and other places. We're not going to let geography be a limiter. So let's, really interesting stuff. There's so many strands we could unfold in, in, in so many different directions. Um, I wanna go to a, a cluster of questions we're having around um, values and leadership, which you've uh, alluded to in, in the concentric model, right? Starting with the self and moving outward uh, to society. How do you, I, I'm gonna put a few questions together that are, are on this theme. When you're interacting with and negotiating um, the terrain of leadership of different organizations, government entities, and, or a whole range of different um, uh, types of entities where you have to work with folks who you don't feel their values are aligned, or maybe you know, um, there's a, a conflict in values, how do you go about making change and leading in an environment where not all actors have aligned values. And, um, you know, you're alluding to being a very value-driven organization um, and where perhaps there are these conflicts in values or ways of, 
um, of um, doing business or, or doing leadership and, and, and uh, in fact, might even be in opposition. <laughs> so what does it look like to negotiate a landscape like that as a values-driven uh, leader and uh, company? Well, within Walmart, people that are not aligned to our values typically get voted off the island. Um, somebody somewhere, the store won't follow the leader or the leader in the home office just really stands out. But outside of Walmart, I think um, we typically just work around impediments. So if there's a supplier or a member of government that doesn't seem to have the right um, the right ideas in mind, not the best uh, uh, objectives, um, we'll find somebody who does and just not work with them. Yeah. I think that work around in a situation where we don't control employment is probably the fastest way to get something done. Yeah. Here's another question, different angle. Um, you know, Walmart is, a, is an, an incredible test case of global supply chains. And, and this is the, highlighting the, um, the strengths and weaknesses within global su supply chains has been a big learning in, in this um, time. And so Jody's asking, where is Walmart investing most to create a virus-free supply chain for the future um, and perhaps to optimize supply chains of the future? And what are the biggest obstacles to this happening? Yeah, so um, let's take the U.S. as an example. We, we buy about two-thirds of what we sell in the U.S. in the U.S. That other third comes from China, India, India Mexico, Canada primarily. Um, we buy a lot of televisions out of Mexico. We get a lot of, of fresh agricultural products out of Mexico. There's, there's a lot of stuff that comes from Canada. China makes a lot of bicycles and electronics and general merchandise categories, generally not, not food. The crisis has shown us, as you've read about in the country, I'm sure, that parts of the health and wellness supply chain tie back to China. We're, we've, we've shipped 50 million masks to our Walmart US store associates in the last six weeks, basically. Most of those came from China. So, you know, we want to make sure that, that for the future, we're thinking about this principle we have of buying locally. We, we want to buy locally because we want customers with good jobs and we want reduced lead times. Our incentives are to buy local. We'd rather buy in the U.S. anytime we can for our U.S. business as opposed to buying in, in Asia. But some things are not made here or they're just not anywhere near a price point that anybody will buy. Yeah. But as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of little problems to solve on, a, on the way to solving a bigger problem. So there's work underway now to think about OTC and other health and wellness categories. Where do the raw materials come from? How do we feel about that? Can we change it? Those are things that I think are largely in front of us. We've started to think about them. We've taken action on some of the things that are more in the crisis category. But I think supply chains around the world are going to be rethought a bit. Now, after they're rethought, I still think there needs to be global trade and you're gonna to wanna to have redundancies. If we, if we have a problem in the United States and we can't make all the masks that we need to make, five years from now, I'd still like to be able to call China and buy masks if we need them. We need to preserve these relationships. And I personally believe that countries that trade together are more peaceful. And I think that's important. Um, so I would like to see some level of global trade, but I understand the fact that, you know, everyone around the world is concerned about their job, their community. And so we, we try to balance these things with our principle being, if we can, we want to buy everything as close to our customer as possible. That's where we start out. Well, I think this is a, a um, coming back from this global perspective to the concentric circle of, of you, Doug, a, a good question to end on from Lisa. Uh, and she says, Doug, your role requires you to be the face of Walmart, particularly in demanding times like these. Thinking about the theme of concentric circles and circles within the role of CEO, how do you maintain a sense of self and not just be the CEO of Walmart, but also be Doug? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, um, it, at this point, it's just kind of happening, not really thinking about it that much. Um, I think as I get older and um, have more time and role, I'm more comfortable um, not overthinking things and just responding, you know, in a natural and authentic way. I'm blessed to work at a place where I know that um, my values are aligned with what our board would want and what the Walton family would want. The Walton family owns basically half the business and 
they want good things. And so I have a tremendous amount of support. The earnings of the company are down since I took this role. Uh, Ron mentioned earlier, we've raised wages. We're still raising wages. Um, there are expenses that we need to put into the business to help it be there for the next generation of retail. I've got support to do that. So I don't really see two different, I don't see a Walmart CEO and myself. I just am being me at this point. Um, and so it, you know, it's a blessing to be able to be that way. Well, uh, on behalf of Ron, of Ron and I, uh, and of the um, Stanford Flourishing Project, thanks for being you with us for this uh, last hour. We really appreciate it. Yeah. And Hope it helps somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you. you and, and, you know, there are so many different rich questions. Uh, thank you to the community for participating in this conversation.